Hello, my friends, and welcome to Monster Monday. Today, I'm going to be talking about a specific kind of monster from this book. <gasps> what? Not a D&D &D book? Bill, how could you? Come, journey with me into the land of White Wolf. Yes, my friends, I know it's probably shocking to you that I'm diverting from the Wizards of the Coast lineup, but uh, Monster Monday really is about thinking about monsters and creative ways to use them and add them in. So I was digging back in time through my old Mage the Ascension book, and I came across an old favorite that I used to enjoy using when we played World of Darkness games like Vampire and Mage, and that is the Nefandi. Now, um, in this game context, there's a very specific thing that these, a very specific role that the Nefandi fill, right? So imagine um, people who are magically inclined, but also hellishly polluted. So um, Nefandi describes a fractious group of mages who generally have only one thing in common. They all have chosen to pass through the calls in order to turn their avatars inside out to serve powerful spirits that can be described only as corruption incarnate. As far as most mages and technocrats know, Nefandi pursue the corruption of all beings in the universe in the mad hopes of driving all beings away from their morals and all that is light, good, and creative. Ultimately, speculators believe the Nefandi seek nothing less than the destruction of the universe. Some of the fallen were born for the path of descent. Others rejected the ideals of ascension to take up corruption's banner. The fallen are not simply evil. They embody corruption and destruction. Stories tell of the Nefandic rebirth where a mage steps into the calls and has her avatar inverted, twisted, and corrupted. Such choice, it is said, must be deliberate. Afterward, the mage becomes a living avatar of whichever Nefandic lord he now serves. Since all factions loathe an obvious Nefandus, the fallen conceal their actions behind temptation, masquerade, and betrayal. The Nefandi seem to have two agendas. The first is to actively corrupt and claim human souls for their masters. To accomplish this goal, they are quite skillful in ferreting out their target's heart's desire and using it against him with great deftness and subtlety. Whatever the wish, the Nefandus is prepared to grant it, or appear to, in exchange for the minor price of one soul. The Nefandi's second overriding agenda is a quest to return their dark lords to earth. Undoubtedly, many believe that they will reap unthinkable rewards for such a victory. Undoubtedly, that victory would destroy the earth and all life on it. That's enough. So um, why, for Monster Monday today, am I talking about something from a completely different non-D&D game? Because sometimes we have to dip out of what is canon to invent our own things. Now, you might say to yourself, Bill, isn't the D&D equivalent of a Nefandi a warlock? Is it? Let's think about that for a moment. Makes a pact for greater power with a otherworldly being. Check. May, not necessarily, depending on your warlock patron, but may seek to subvert other people to acquire their, goal, their souls. Uh, maybe. Um, may want the destruction of the world, possibly. I guess that, that depends on what kind of warlock you're making. What about a necromancer? Isn't this the same as a D&D necromancer? Mm, maybe, in some cases. What about a devil or a demon, Bill? Possibly. So I feel like the Nefandi is a little bit of all those influences, but it's still kind of unique. And when taken out of the world of darkness and, and, and converted into Dungeons and Dragons, I could very easily see a Nefandi being its own kind of unique concoction. The idea that a spellcaster seeking powers that it shouldn't 
be able to access that they shouldn't be able to access. Arcane magic, nonetheless. But then there being a price for that arcane magic. So maybe the D&D equivalent of a Nefandus would be a dark wizard who maybe has a mix of warlock in there and maybe has um, made packs with otherworldly beings, um, great old ones, or a fiend of some kind, depending on the arc that you want to go. But really what we're talking about here isn't stat blocks. Um, it's the idea for a monster that is so powerful that you would build a campaign around it. And really not even a monster, a villain could be a coterie of villains. This could be an entire cabal. Now, I'm not recommending that you steal the name of Nefandi or the white wolf representation of the Nefandi or, the, or of a Nefandus, but I am saying that you can use it as inspiration and you can create your own sinister, diabolical campaign faction with one or more of these types of NPCs. Maybe some of them are lower level agents of this faction who your party initially encounters in some normal adventure. Maybe these are recurring bad guys who keep pestering the party and tries to like obstruct the party from doing good. Maybe there's an infiltrator, an NPC who seems friendly like an ally and builds trust with the party only for them to later reveal that he is marked as one of the faction that you have created. But I like this influence because it brings a certain kind of sinister mystery to it, as well as a very real threat to the party should they ignore that faction. Because that faction in your campaign world could continuously be doing stuff that this party would have a great quandary with. Assuming that your campaign is full of good guys, heroes, adventurers who seek fame and fortune and fun and adventure, but also generally have a good bend to them. Um, it would make sense that a faction who is diametrically opposite to that, not just in alignment, but in politics, in their goals, their goals of acquiring souls and their goals of returning their ancient masters to the realms. Maybe they're conducting you know, dark rituals. Maybe they've stolen certain important artifacts to open up gates. Maybe they've kidnapped certain key people to conduct sacrifices. Whatever, you could take six or seven of those different little encounter ideas, turn them into adventures, and then interconnect them into a massive campaign where this faction that you have created based on the Nefandi, or let's say influenced by the concept of the Nefandi could be one of the greatest campaigns you've ever run. Simple? Perhaps. Perhaps you could say that the same thing could be said about any devils or demons that are in the published books. Maybe you could say that some of the um, trademarked um, factions, such as the Rouge arcane spellcasters of a land that starts with a T and ends with a Y and has HA in the middle. Um, maybe those are, you know, what you model your stuff after, or you use them directly in your games. But I think the takeaway from this is that there's almost no idea from literature, from other games, that... Um, that you, could, you, you would be barred from using in your own games. You could basically take influence from this. You could take influence from real world cultures and ancient religions and archeology span and take ideas and mold them into your own thing. Um, and, and this concept that attracted me back to this book worked really well in a modern setting when we played modern White Wolf, World of Darkness and Vampire and Mage but it also worked extremely well when we played Dark Ages, um, which was another setting that White Wolf put out so that you could play your vampire, werewolf, um, changeling, you know, all the different games that they put out and mage in the Dark Ages. 
which had a very different feel to it. And frankly, Dark Ages uh, World of Darkness was not all that different from D&D. So the idea of this you know, powerful faction, this cult, cabals of these you know, sleeper cells of these different things infiltrating into governments and you know, who knows what, I mean, think almost like an Illuminati kind of thing um, with a very diabolical purpose. These could be uh, a driving force in your campaign. They could have story threads with tons of adventures, some obvious and maybe some not so obvious. You know? And what I mean by that is like an obvious thing would be like the, you know, the princess of blah, blah, blah kingdom has been kidnapped by an evil cult and she's going to be sacrificed. You have to find where they went and they have a hidden underground base. That leads to a dungeon crawl. It leads to the temple underground where they're about to do the sacrifice. The group makes their way in. They kill all the cultists. They rec rescue the princess, the end. That's a, an obvious kind of mission-based adventure. But you could also have regular adventures that have nothing to do with this faction on the surface that you then introduce certain NPCs, either as villains or as kind of undercover infiltrators um, where the party gets to know these recurring NPCs and maybe even gets to trust them and consider them allies. And then you utilize that in the campaign to create new challenges. And the party might begin to wonder, like how come this faction always seems to know where we're going and what we're doing? Maybe they wise up and they realize that their friend, uh, Hank the Hammer, who they've been adventuring with for the last three levels, is not someone to be trusted. Maybe they're able to interrogate Hank, and Hank's actually, you know, at a point where he breaks and he reveals his affiliation with the cult and gives them more information, which then leads them to another adventure. Slowly but surely, you can, you can do this. Now, one final note. When playing Mage, I often wondered what it would be like to play a Nefandus. What if we had a, a coven, a cabal, a chantry of these warlocks? What would, what would be the case? You too could experiment that with that in D&D. &D. Um, we've all joked about what it would be like to have like a party of all bards or a party of all monks. What if you had a party of all warlocks? What if you and your gaming group decided, hey, guys, let's talk about this, but I have an idea. What if you all made a party of warlocks who served evil beings and the purpose of this campaign was for you to work together to form a, a powerful coterie within this giant faction, within this organization, and rise to power? Now, I would strongly urge you to have some, some serious discussion about going down that route because there's a lot of disturbing material that you can cover if you're playing in an evil campaign. And you know, make sure to talk with people about what they're comfortable with in terms of their game, in terms of their storyline, in terms of themes. Make sure that you're not gonna be disturbing anyone with that. But if you're all able to handle it and you decide that you wanna try a evil campaign this could definitely be a gateway for you to be able to try that in a role-playing game, which is all fictional and not real. And therefore, you could try that in a sort of safe environment. But anyway, I thought it would be interesting to do a Monster Monday, not so much focused on something out of a book, but more focused on the ideas that you could use when you take inspiration from something, even from another game system that is totally different from D&D, and how you can convert that and use those ideas to create simple encounters, basic, straightforward, obvious adventures, or even long-term, long-game kind of campaign ideas. So hopefully you enjoyed this. If you didn't, that's fine too. Either way, leave a comment below. And uh, if you did enjoy it, give it a thumbs up, give it a like. If you didn't enjoy it, give it a thumbs down because I, I like feedback from people. And of course, I ask you to please consider subscribing and clicking on the notifications bell so that you know when the next episode of Monster Monday comes out. Until we meet again, my friends, Shazam.